All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and for uh, being with us here today. Uh, I'm going to give everybody a few moments to log in, get settled, and then we will start this uh, presentation. So happy you're here. All right, let's go ahead and get started today. Thank you everybody uh, for being with us here today. Welcome to the first session in the data leadership using CASP data for system improvement training series. You are here for session one, the role of summative data in a data use culture. So before we get uh, started today, just a little bit of housekeeping, some Zoom housekeeping. I know we're all pros, but it's always good to go over the basics. Um, we're going to ask everybody to stay muted. You should be muted, but uh, just in case something happens, unless otherwise directed. Um, if you need to mute, you can select the microphone icon. And then there will be points throughout this webinar that we're going to ask people to engage with us using the chat feature. And you can select the chat icon um, on your Zoom uh, window. It's usually on the right side of the screen or wherever it's floating around on your desktop. So we are going to be using Padlet today as the place that we're going to be posting uh, questions and also a place to house resources that we talk about throughout this training series. Uh, the link to the Padlet has been dropped into the chat box for you. And we're going to take a few minutes to just go through the, uh, the Padlet uh, right now. Okay, so this is the Padlet that we've created for this particular session. Uh, if there are resources here that you would like to come back to later, this Padlet will be available for you at the conclusion of our time together today, and you can feel free to utilize it as a resource. However, please be aware that after uh, that, at the conclusion of this uh, of this webinar, the Padlet will not will no longer be monitored. So if you have additional follow-up questions, please do not post them to this particular Padlet. Um, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, there is uh, some a column about meeting information. If you need to grab the materials, you can do so right here. There's information about attendance verification if needed, and also an evaluation form for the conclusion of this webinar, which we'll talk about a little more in detail. If you need any technical support for this webinar, you can post any questions here. In order to post a question to any of these columns, you can select the plus symbol, and then you can type your question right here uh, if there's a topic, and then the body of your question can be down below. You can select the publish button, and then your question will appear underneath that column. Uh, panelists and uh, support will be monitoring the Padlet throughout our presentation today and responding to questions as well. And uh, if you have, for example, a technical question, we may not be able to answer that question in real time right here, because what we'll do is we'll go to the appropriate people, whether it's at ETS, CDE, to ensure that you're, we're providing you with the most accurate information. So if at the conclusion of our time together today, you do not see an answer to your question, please check back in a day or two, because we will be um, making sure that we provide answers to all questions posed during our time today. So I'm going to hand it over in just a few more minutes uh, to our training team. We are so thrilled to have with us today, Evan Bartelheim, who is the Accountability and Data Literacy uh, leader at the Los Angeles County Office of Education, and also Joe Valero, who is an executive leadership coach at the Office of the Fresno County Superintendent of Schools. So a little bit about our data leadership training series. It is made up of four sessions. You are here today for session one, the role of summative data in a data use culture. Session two is about putting data in context to make decisions. 
Session three is about leadership and culture for effective data use. And session four is a shared practice panel where uh, practitioners from the field are going to get together to explain uh, some systems that they have put in place at their sites. And it's an opportunity for participants to engage with those panelists and ask any, any questions that they have around uh, building a data use culture at, at a particular site. So our agenda here today, uh, we're now going over the welcome and housekeeping. Uh, our first session is about assessment literacy and summative assessment. Next, we'll talk about summative data in context. Then we're going to discuss some resources that are available for your analysis of 2022-23 summative data. And then finally, we'll have a wrap up where we're going to ask you to please respond to an evaluation uh, at the conclusion of our time here today. So just like teachers in the classroom, we wanna be sure that we're clear about our goals for learning here today. So our learning goals for session one are that participants will reflect on how summative assessment data supports system improvement in a local assessment system. Uh, participants will identify important considerations for using summative results that are specific to the 22-23 test administration and context. And finally, you will understand where to access and how to leverage relevant summative assessment resources. And our success criteria for this session uh, is that participants can leverage resources to use summative data to inform decision making. So as we begin here today in chat, please let us know what your role is. We know sometimes people wear many hats. So where is the bulk of your time spent? Just to get an idea of who is in the room here today. Okay, so I see CDE is here, hello. Uh, teacher, great, principal level, excellent. Research planning and evaluation specialist. Instructional coach administrator. Okay, lots of administrators, curriculum instruction and assessment, data analyst, people at the district level, people at the LEA level. I saw a TOSA, I believe, um, the director of assessment and accountability. Uh, lots of assessment people here today. Happy to have you. Uh, lots of district level personnel as well. Uh, and also uh, people who work specifically with student data. So really happy to have you all here. I think whatever your role is, all the roles that I saw uh, coming through on the chat, there's something in here for you today. So we're very happy that you're here with us. And now I am gonna go ahead and hand it over to our panelists. All right, thank you, Chelsea. Uh, Joe Valero, Office of the Fresno County Superintendent of Schools. Uh, we are really, really excited to be here today with everybody. Uh, so let's start off. Let's start off with assessment literacy and summative assessments. So in this section, we'll discuss some foundational information around assessment literacy, and we're going to dive into the purpose of summative assessment within a balanced assessment system. So to get us started, to, to get us grounded, uh, let's take a dive into assessment literacy. So we do have a quote right here on the screen. And so let's all read the quote together. I was about to throw a joke. Let's not do that. I was gonna say, let's all unmute ourselves and read it together. No, let's not coral read. I'll read it. Please read along with us. And then uh, we'll, we'll get a little deeper into it. So talking about assessment literacy. So assessment literacy is defined as the knowledge about how to assess what students know and can do, interpret the results of these assessments and apply these results to improve student learning and program effectiveness. That's from Web 2002. And so through um, though the focus of this learning series is on summative assessments, uh, we just wanna please keep in mind the context of a comprehensive and balanced assessment system. Comprehensive assessment systems use multiple types of assessments to meet the needs of multiple types of interest holders. Let's think about where those different types of assessments fit 
and to what extent the results of those different assessments meet the needs of different types of interest holders. Additionally, please keep in mind considerations regarding equity that are built into your assessment system and whether those considerations help to promote equitable outcomes for all students. I'm continuing with assessment literacy. There are multiple factors that can differentiate assessment types. These can include grain size, which refers to the specificity of information being assessed, as well as frequency and timing and the purpose of the assessment. The conditions under which an assessment is administered, flexibility, design, and the use of resulting data are also important factors. Types and purposes of different assessments. Thinking about your local assessment system, recall the following types of assessment. The formative assessment process, which happens on a minute by minute, day by day basis to inform teaching and learning. Tools for teachers, resources can support the formative assessment process in California classrooms. If you haven't had a chance yet to really get into tools for teachers, it is a robust system filled with great resources that are um, teacher created, teacher vetted, and just really go over and connect really well to the, to the Smarter Balanced ecosystem. Um, interim assessments, which are administered at specific intervals over the course of the year, are used to monitor students' progress towards longer term goals and also inform teacher instruction and school improvement. Smarter balanced interim assessments in English language arts and mathematics are available for all California teachers. Past interim assessments are also going to be available soon, uh, looking like the fall, fingers crossed, super excited about those. And then summative assessments, which measure students' knowledge and skills relative to specific learning standards or goals and are used to inform planning at the school level. This module will focus on the appropriate uses of summative assessment data. Summative assessments within the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, or CASP. In this training series, we will focus on state summative assessment data. The statewide CASP includes a number of summative assessments that are administered to students across the entire state of California. These assessments include the Smarter Balanced Summative Assessments for English Language Arts and Mathematics and the CAST. These assessments are required to be administered to all students at particular grade levels. Each summative assessment listed here provides educators with important information about what students know and can do in specific content areas. CASP also includes the California Alternate Assessments or CAAs for ELA, Mathematics, and Science. Summative data in a balanced assessment system. In a comprehensive, balanced, and equitable assessment system, each assessment type will yield different types of information about student knowledge, skills, and abilities that can be used to inform teaching and learning. Your local assessment system will include the CASP summative assessments, as well as the additional summative assessments students within your system will take. These may include end of year exams, unit tests, or other project-based culminating assessments. They may have been developed locally or may have been taken directly from curricular materials. The data yielded from summative data provides an overall description of a student's learning status at the end of a period of learning. Therefore, it does not provide information that immediately informs ongoing teaching and learning of individual students. It provides comparable data that can be used, whoops, sorry, my light turned off on me in here. I need to move more. <laughs> comparable data that can be used to understand student learning at the school or local, edu um, local educational agency or LEAs, and also the state level, and along with other measures, and that's the key, it's one measure. We wanna go over and connect it to other measures, along with other measures, also informs program level and school improvement planning. Traditional uses of summative data. Well, we can use it for decision-making, identification of inequity and ways to address it, evaluation of the efficacy of current initiatives, planning of instruction, and allocation of resources. But also we wanna keep in mind the identification of student groups for particular purposes. 
So traditionally, these have, been, these have been the appropriate uses of summative assessment data. However, we should think carefully and critically about the appropriate uses of summative assessment data and how best to use this data to support student learning and equity. This will be the focus, once again, of this training series. So let's have a brief chance to reflect and uh, let's utilize the chat. So we have a question for everybody. It's consider your local assessment system. For what purposes do you use summative data? We'll think about that here for a few seconds. Once again, consider your local assessment system. For what purposes do you use summative data? And we're going to open up the chat right here and we'll go on ahead and place our answers in the chat. Considering our, or excuse me, your local assessment system, or what purposes do you use summative data for? We're starting to get some into the chat, love it. Yeah, to guide teaching, guide PL. Mm -hmm. School plan, can I get the school plans, charter renewals, LCAP goals? Planning instruction, seeing a lot of planning, planning with data. I think of um, being thoughtful, that's being really thoughtful as we're planning, using data to go over and, and, and connect it, build off of needs. Mm -hmm. Once again, yes, better understand the needs of student groups. LCAP, seeing LCAP pop up a lot. Student progress, programs, love it. Improvement projects for schools and districts, measuring growth year to year. We have the A plus group here. <laughs> we do, Joe. I'm like impressed. You know, it runs the gamut from guiding instruction to writing an LCAP. And I know they're singing our song when they talk in LCAP or big planning because that's kind of where we live. But yeah, it's great when, when you can use that data to drive instruction locally, right? Love it. They're speaking our love language here, Evan. <laughs> Love it, continue, please continue adding into the chat as we're uh, moving along. And I'm gonna turn this over to Evan. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm Evan Bartelheim from LA County Office of Education. I'm the project director for the Accountability and Data Literacy Unit. And we work a lot with our assessment team here for our assessment and accountability network. Um, and we're gonna talk uh, about the summative data using the summative data in context. So, uh, Context is important and just coincidentally, Joe and I just met in person for the first time in three years. It was kind of like, uh, hey, wow, you're taller than I expected. <laughs> it's like, but that's been our context, right? You know, we still are experiencing the ripple effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We feel it, you know, even though it seems like it's mostly back to normal, we know we're still seeing effects, including uh, ongoing issues with attendance. Um, so this year, as you dig into your summative assessment data, you'll want to consider what other pieces of data you have that can provide additional context for this year's administration and how you can use that data to inform your understanding of this year's assessment results. Now, looking back, we, we did this last year. There was a great report that the CDE provided that looked at the 21-22 statewide results. And we saw at that time that the percentage of students uh, meeting or exceeding standards on smarter balanced assessments uh, they were down four percentage points uh, for ELA, down from 51% to 47%, and they were down seven percentage points uh, for, for math, from 40% to 33%, um, when compared to students who took the test in 2018-19, the last time it was a, a full statewide administration took place. Um, for ELA math, they also noticed that the lower grades uh, saw larger differentials uh, from 2018-19 than those the higher, higher grade levels, and I think that doesn't surprise us. That was the kids who are most impacted, kids who had you know, only started reading during the pandemic and then came out to, to be assessed for the first time. So it didn't surprise us. Um, so positive notes for the California uh, science test, the CAS. Um, student scores were generally consistent with pre-pandemic levels. Um, there are small increases for some groups and some grade levels and small decreases in others, but it was largely consistent. And then they did an <clears throat> analysis of the 21-22 uh, cohort. So these are students who are among the small group because it was only about 20% or so of students statewide who took the assessment when it was uh, provided as a, if you if it was possible to do it within your local context. So of those students who took the test uh, in 21 uh, and then again 
compared to that in 22, um, they showed the steeper than normal achievement gains at most grade levels. So that suggested that once students got back in and they started testing or they started learning in person again, that there was a pretty rapid increase. So this is something I would expect now that now that we've had two years of statewide uh, assessment results. So everybody's going to have two years worth of data. This is something I'm expecting um, to look at, you know, both for our LACO schools as well as uh, some of the schools and districts that we serve. That this is something we're going to want to look at. And when I was the assessment and accountability director for a district, you know, I was very interested in year over year growth. So I think that that's what we're going to see. Did our interventions that we implemented during this time work? Um, what about other actions that we implemented locally? Do we have to continue with these programs? Are they successful? So just like Joe was talking about, planning is a big piece of how you might want to use this data. So uh, we do want to consider some potential considerations for the use of summative data for the 22-23 administration. Um, and you need to be uh, mindful of some summative data uh, elements this year. Um, first, you want to ensure uh, the appropriate use of the summative results. And this is going to require LA lead, LEA leaders, uh, teachers, and parents uh, that they be provided with support in how to interpret the data. Um, in our experience here at LACO, in working with schools and districts, using assessment data in a meaningful and appropriate way requires a systematic approach. Um, you need to have a system in place before you jump in and start analyzing, reflecting, collaborating, and planning. It's going to ensure that everyone's voice is heard and people feel a degree of trust and that they can speak openly and, and without fear um, that they can share all their thoughts. Um, and we're going to talk more about these uh, leadership uh, needs in the next few slides. Also, are you including multiple measures? We always talk about multiple measures. Um, so as you're reviewing the data, what other insights into student learning does do, do you have? Um, for example, we're going to be working with the district in the next month, and we're going to be looking um, at how the uh, summative assessment results um, look in relation to the attendance data for the year. Chronic absenteeism was a huge issue in 21-22, and we know it hasn't gone away uh, in 22-23, but maybe not to the extreme, and we want to see the connection uh, because that it's important to be able not only to address the chronic absenteeism, but also to bring light to it for our educational partners, you know, the parents of our students are the ones who maybe have the biggest impact on our attendance. And if we see um, slow gains in student groups that had high chronic absenteeism, it's definitely an area of need. Um, also, um, how might you distinguish between reviewing this data for uh, state accountability concerns versus using it for local concerns? And of course, context matters, right? Are you reviewing the data as part of a team at a school who's been identified for comprehensive support and improvement, um, CSI or ATSI? Or are you sharing the results with community members whose interests um, might be very different than CSI, ATSI? Maybe they don't even know what CSI, ATSI is. So you got to consider your context when you're sharing. Um, in the chat, tell me, what are your local factors that you're going to be considering when reviewing your data? I'm curious what, what some of your local uh, concerns may be. I have, so I have twin twin daughters who are sophomores in high school, and they managed to elude state testing, right? They were sixth grade last time. And then when we implemented testing again, they've been in high school, but not a degree that's tested. Um, so, but yeah, I'm curious as to what the results will reflect at their school. Um, absenteeism, thanks, Amy, um, big deal at her school. It still continues to be a real quandary. And it's, it seems like the new normal. What other local context matters for looking at your assessment results? Joe, what are you hearing in, in uh, Fresno County? Yeah, for so for us, it, same, we're really looking at absenteeism, absenteeism as well. I'm really challenging to say in the afternoon now. Absenteeism, just looking at that connection, but also um, there have been some new initiatives that have been coming out lately locally. And so whether it was around writing or whether they were reading, it's taking that deeper look. Once the summative data comes out, going a little deeper, looking at um, claims and targets, um, information a little more granular just to go over and see is there any indication that it was um, we see some success with that or is there something that might need to be refined seeing yeah. a lot coming into the chat as well students yeah with the increasing achievement yeah so, i do see a lot the uh, absenteeism of course resonates um, working with specific student groups like english learners students with disabilities which of course you know some of the groups that were most impacted 
um, that we saw coming out with the biggest um, you know drops or the the in their overall test scores. I think where we uh, put a lot of effort in the last year. I like seeing MTSS because I know a lot of our uh, school districts and charter schools have been working on building a more robust MTSS framework and uh, having a better understanding of how it works. Um, focusing on growth, um, not just meeting the needs of proficient of bubble kids. I did notice too, speaking to new board members, and I do think this is so important, like how are you communicating this to, to people who, um, new leaders in the community who maybe weren't in place, you know, when you've worked with them before. That as my role in my previous district, it was a big part being able to communicate to the board. So. These are all great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, um, if you don't mind, Devin, I want to touch one more on that last one. I think that was a really big one, which is really dispelling the myth of bubble kids and, um, you know, really how our, our accountability system now really doesn't allow us to go over and have bubble kids anymore. So to, to Teresa's point, what she was putting into the chat, I love it. It's really focusing on looking at those scale scores, looking at really increased, you know, distance from standard, um, scale score uh, growth, for lack of a better term right now, and really just going over and looking, can we improve year over year? So I love uh, what's, what's in the chat right here. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. I do too. I know. I, 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 I've been around long enough to remember the era when you did kind of focus on the low-hanging fruit, right? And I love with the distance from standard that really you have to address the needs of all your learners, right? Both your uh, your students who are at the highest levels, as well as students who could potentially make the greatest gains for the students or below standard uh, in performance. Um, so we go to the next slide, please. But so ensuring the assessment data is being used appropriately and effectively definitely takes um, good leadership. Um, but this is not only the leadership that our you know LEA leaders provide. Um, this is anyone really taking the lead in using data to make decisions. And I think all of you, by being here, I'm anointing you assessment leadership because you're taking the initiative to be here. It shows you have an interest. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you're probably the type of uh, educators who are going to go back and, and want to be most informed. Um, but really, it's, you know, teacher leaders, technical people. I saw some SIS uh, and data people in here. Um, professional development leaders. I noticed somebody mentioned that use of data to, to guide professional development decisions, um, test coordinators, and you know even our community members, the people who can really help us take the message to the community and share what the data means. So there are some key ways that leaders can support the appropriate use of data um, for good decision making, and these include the following: um, building a common understanding of assessment data and literacy. This could include uh, understanding how the assessment connects to state standards. And it's been a long time since, you know, we were introduced to the state standards. Um, and sometimes it may not be clear to people in, in the community what, what the connection is, what do these tests represent. I think sometimes I hear, oh, you know, we test kids too much, but not really recognizing the nuance, how closely cued these tests are to, to the curriculum we're teaching. Uh, also supporting a culture of effective data use. You know, this is one in which we're looking for a continuous improvement model. Um, it should be collaborative empowering, but also have a level of accountability, both individual accountability and collective accountability across uh, the LEA. Um, is the uh, leaders will make sure that the what they're communicating and their, their processes are aligned with uh, the local mission, vision, and equity goals, right? As these are things you might find in your LCAP and your strategic plan, your, your SIPSA, your school's charter. So definitely want to make sure that the data analysis is connected to that. And finally, effective leadership is going to establish um, norms and practices for assessment and data use, right? You just don't, here's the data, let's go. And that's kind of what we really try to, to emphasize here in our work when we're working with LEAs is you really want to slow down and look at the data, you know, keep yourself down on the ladder of inference, not to jump to conclusions and, and honor all voices. And, you know, make sure you have an empty cup that you can fill with knowledge, even if you think you know everything, right? There's always more to learn if you're open to learning. And we're going to be discussing assessment leadership in greater depth in uh, session three. So I definitely encourage you to come back for that. So the other piece, so assessment data, you know, while it's an important tool for understanding our system and learning the outcomes it produces in order to make the kind of improvements to the system that we need to, without making equity kind of the priority in this work, 
uh, we do risk arriving at a flawed understanding of student learning. Um, and this could potentially cause harm to students, right? We've jumped to conclusions, we jumped to the wrong conclusions. Um, it could lead us in the wrong direction. So in order to use summative assessment data effectively, we need to establish an equity mindset. And this approach does the following. It places an explicit focus on centering equity in conversations around data and, and data use. Uh, it also requires the active interrogation of our implicit bias. We all have biases. So understanding that we have those and making sure we challenge those um, as we look at the data is important. It ensures that those working with student data consider each learner as an individual. I think that's, we all got into the profession for this reason, right? We, but it is easy sometimes when you're looking at the numbers and especially when the numbers get big to forget that there are kids on the end. I think being a parent has really emphasized that for me and, and knowing that my kids are the ones and, and it really matters to me how my student performs. Um, we wanna challenge beliefs and support uh, learning that does not just confirm our assumptions and our biases. It's easy to go that route. Like I said, how do we keep our self down low on the ladder of inference and not jump to conclusions? Uh, it, the, the approach seeks to identify and address barriers that uh, drive observed student inequities, right? We want to notice these inequities so that we may address them. And we're going to dive deeper into data use in sessions two and three, as I noted, but but keeping that equity mindset is really a focus for, for all of our sessions. So a really important part, uh, similar to the equity mindset, is the engagement of your educational partners. It's an important aspect of using assessment data to understand and improve your system. Um, without engaging your educational partners, your, your risk of missing some important information uh, about learning um, about your students. And it could lead you to draw some faulty or incomplete conclusions. I mean, as a parent, you know, I really want to be heard, right? And I know a lot of things maybe about uh, my community that that um, the local leadership may not know. And I want to be able to share that with them and I want to feel heard. So, you know, educational partners can include parents and guardians, of course, but it also includes students. We want to hear student voice. They have the most incredible viewpoint, I think. And it's nothing cuts through uh, like student voice, in my opinion. Um, and it can include your other community members as well. These partners have valuable information um, to contribute that may or not be recorded anywhere else in your assessment system. Um, so to the extent that you can, uh, you should consider using these partners uh, in the interpretation of your summative assessment data, which of course that's gonna require some building of, of knowledge and capacity and understanding what it means. And I can tell you though, uh, these groups are eager, definitely eager to receive information about where the students are in their learning and collaborating with these groups allows for their meaningful contributions um, and a deepening of the overall picture of student knowledge and skills. And you know, I found that you know, working with the LCAP, working with my site councils uh, when I was in the district, was always a rich source. And especially, you know, we did a um, we did a district wide uh, equity plan with uh, Dr. Pedro Nagara. This is in 2016. And it involved a lot of work with student groups and we had focus groups. And that information was possibly the most powerful information that came out about all of it. What kids were actually experiencing in the classrooms, it was impossible to ignore. So the extent to which you can include uh, students, you know, in the in your conversation around student, student data, they may tell you why the scores are flat. It may be a surprise to you. So I definitely recommend that. We're going to talk more about this in session two as well. Um, so, one thing that we definitely know and have experienced anytime you're sharing state summative assessment data is, of course, is some of the highest profile data in our local systems. It's what people cling to. It's you know generally released earlier than the dashboard comes out, so people rush to it, right? And they're going to come to it with uh, you know, quick analysis and takeaways. Um, so there's a lot of pressures that coming both from inside and outside the system, um, and it can be difficult to make. Uh, efficient use of our data. Uh, but really the test scores are only a starting point to addressing these issues. And of course, test scores uh, alone in a vacuum don't tell the whole story. Um, they're really just a starting point for further investigation. And that's always, I think, what we wanna focus on is, yes, we have this data, it's it's helpful, but what else do we wanna know? What's, what else, what other data do you need to have a complete picture? Um, so what other, any other data you have at your disposal to help create this fuller picture? of what students know and what skills they have um, is important and how to appropriately use the data you have and how to engage your educational partners in this uh, meaningful uh, 
this meaningful data in some kind of transparent conversation is really important, right? I think to give them a, a full picture, and I think it's one of the things that's really a challenge too, is getting your educational partners up to speed on, on this data and having them also see, you know, what else you have, school climate data, for example, um, any data around attendance, something that gives them a fuller picture, and but it takes a while and it does require some patience in, in training uh, and building that knowledge and capacity. So let's take another moment to reflect. Um, I'm going to give you this question, read this question, and after you reflect for a second, enter it in the chat, chat box. So what are some of the pressures that you face that make it difficult to create an accurate picture of student learning to ensure summative data is used appropriately and or to have transparent conversations with your educational partners? Think about this for a minute and then drop your response in the chat. Kirsten jumps right to the first thing, I think, accessing data. This is a big part, right? Um, and I was the gatekeeper, unfortunately. It makes it really difficult if you have limited access. The more friction that exists between accessing data, um, the harder it is, right? You want it to flow. Fear of math. Yes, people are afraid of data. And this is kind of our mission here is to, to decrease that, uh, decrease that, um, effective response when people hear data and it can, you can see that it's like, I don't do data. I was an English teacher. Um, so I would, I definitely came from a different side of the house, you know, but I was always intrigued by data. And I do think that's a piece, you know, you, you can use your data to tell a story. Um, and that's an important uh, distinction. And maybe that lowers the barriers for a student or for, for your people who are afraid of the math that's involved. <laughs> Finding the correct denominator to get the correct percentage, uh, even though, I, yeah, everybody wants to know the rules, the business rules, things like that. Well, we answer a lot of questions like that, and I I, I wish I always knew what exactly it would be because there, it's to some degree, if you're taking the assessment data and trying to convert it into the dashboard data, there's it's a little bit of a black box, um, I know, but um, the rules are out there. Um, Time needed to create pictures that give a more holistic view of our students, right? Satellite to street, the street data, yeah, that's uh, that's key, right? And I do think we we do ourselves no favors if we stop at the level of just sharing out our summative assessment results and don't give a bigger picture. More data coaches, yes, uh, but yeah, it, I guess the, the point here, in the, those of you who are here, everyone could be a data coach, right? If they have the, the capacity. Uh, yeah, Virginia, educator distrust in state assessments. Boy, that is like a uh, a real challenge to overcome too, right? I think just in general, and I kind of feel like there's always going to be a percentage of the naysayers who don't find value or will say they don't find value. But I think um, there are a lot of tools. And Joe mentioned tools for teachers. There are so many things coming out, the Lexile quantile information Joe's going to talk about in a minute. All these things I think will make a really good selling point for those teachers. If you're the person responsible for winning them over, I think there's more and more that the state assessment system provides that may make believers out of um, those naysayers. Well, thank you for your, your wonderful responses in the chat. Um, these are all great and spot on, and I'm gonna hand it back over to Joe. Yeah, thank you, Evan. Yeah, and, and just re really going back to what was in the chat is really saw a lot of accessing data, um, saw the, uh, the word tools come up a few times, and really, we're talking about resources. And so with that, let's pivot. Uh, those of us that have been LEA coordinators for a few years, remember the P word pivot? Uh, we had to pivot a lot the last few years. We're going to pivot here um, to talking about resources for the 22-23 uh, summative data analysis. So uh, to, to the point of uh, what we've been talking about in the chat and to the point of uh, what Evan was talking about earlier, there are a lot of resources that are available for us to go over and really look through and make sense of, of the data that's available for us. And so what we're going to do right here is just talk through um, a number of resources that are available uh, for use for any of the analysis that we need to do for any of our task summative data. Uh, the first, the first one, um, this was a game changer. I thought it was a really big game changer when it came out, but um, we're gonna start with the California Educator Reporting System or SIRS. Um, we all like to speak in acronyms, really uh, very seldom do we ever call it you know, by its full name, but um, California Educator Reporting System, or once again, SIRS, 
It provides teachers and other LEA staff with current and prior year student test results. Um, uh, taking a step back, just thinking about, you know, we're going to sound, uh, what is it? I'm going to sound like old man Valero here, but, you know, back in the old days when we would, uh, you know, look at student data, if we, if we had students that came into our district, we weren't the ones uh, that initially tested the students. Sometimes it was a challenge to go over and, and really see how did students perform back in, uh, you know, three years prior, two years prior, even maybe it was the previous year, we didn't test them, but we didn't have their test scores. Well, SERS right here is the big game changer because what SERS does is it just houses all historical um, summative data from Smarter Balanced, LPAC, you name it, the cast, and it follows the students. We may not have assessed the students, but as long as you know we're rostering the students uh, appropriately, we have access to, to those historical scores. So once again, just a really big change for us. And, and you know, I'll even switch over to my old EL days where um, I was an EL coordinator, new student, how the student perform on LPAC, are they in the L? What were they? What level were they? Um, and playing the game of trying to go over and hunt down, you know, previous information. I mean, it was just the system is just so robust and so fantastic. So, uh, just a really big game changer for those of us that um, come from that old world of, um, you know, having to go over and do things by hand. Uh, but we just want to make a quick note, though, about SIRS is that we just do want to keep in mind that it is a secure website. And being that it's secure, you do need a single sign-on uh, through the Test Operations Management System or, or TOMS. You'll need a, role, a certain role to be able to access the information inside of it. And so really it's just providing, once again, current and prior year student test results. It contains, once again, everything, not everything, excuse me, but historical, um, historical data, smarter balance, goes back, um, LPAC cast, interim assessments, um, you know, we, we have really great historical information in there, um, whether it's, once again, summative or interim assessments. And, you know, it all depends on the creation, though, of the year. Once again, we're not going to find SELT in there or, or some other um, CST, things like that uh, from, from way, way, way in the past. But, um, you know, those, those would not be housed inside of SERS. Um, but it's also going to provide us the earliest access to results for all CASP summative assessments. I mean, even right now, it is like an election. I mean, it was like Mervyn's, you know, a couple of weeks ago, waiting for it to open, 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 uh, just to go over and see those test results. And every day we log in, um, our, our colleagues at the California Department of Education and ETS have just done a wonderful job of going over, getting it updated. The system is continuing to update as time goes by, as more scores are, are coming in. And really teachers and, and local leaders around in, in our area, in Fresno County, have been just clicking away in there, looking at the data, very eager. It's really early. We're getting data early. I mean, thinking about years ago, back you know when I when I was a teacher in the classroom, minister CST. Yeah, I'm going back that far. We <laughs> have minister CST. We get the results, and, and it's August and September. I already had you know my plans going over the summer, trying to plan out for the new school year. Well, now things are changed. We have data really early on this year, and how does that change? Our planning going forward now that we have fresh usable data to go over thoughtfully plan out over the summer. Um, what it's also going to do is it's going to give access to student interim assessment results if we haven't had a chance to go in administer an interim assessment and see that granular information in there by item type, um, by key distractor analysis. There are some amazing reports in there that really help us with the formative process inside of, um, inside of the California Educator Reporting System or, or SERS. It is a big system. And so we do need some resources to go over and support us with it. And so the very first one, there is a SERS resources webpage and it includes videos that help with building prerequisite knowledge um, as well as providing additional resources uh, to go over and, and navigate SERS. Um, the SERS user guide describes the features of SERS and provides detailed instructions for using each feature within the system. It's an online version you can click, you can search, you can um, use control find, go over, uh, find certain areas within it to go over and help us better uh, navigate um, SERS in the SERS system. Another great resource that is utilized a lot, we utilize it a ton, is the SERS Sandbox. Um, the SERS Sandbox is a training tool and it's intended really to help 
LEA staff learn about the different features and functions inside of SIRS in a non-secure environment. It offers virtually the same functions as the reporting system, but uses practice test items and every student is fake in there. So there's no PII, there's nothing in there to go over and really give away any student information, um, but great way to go over and just practice. Clicking in, if let's say in, 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 our, in a particular organization, we have an administered interim assessments, but we wanna see what the data is going to look like. What is the item level information going to look like? What's key distractor going to look like? This sandbox is a powerful, powerful tool to go over and really just play in the system. You cannot break it, it's unbreakable. We tried really hard, we couldn't. <laughs> and we're still continuing to try. So please get in there for people that are sometimes worried about clicking things, it cannot be broken, click around, play in the system. You're able to go over and find lots of different uh, resources in there. Um, Remember, you don't need a username or password to access the SIRS sandbox. So for the real SIRS, yes, you do need a password, but sandbox account, completely open. You just go, you go in, and uh, there is a link um, for reference in the resource guide um, that has been shared. Everything is in your resource guide. So above the website, or not above, but even beyond the website, there are some upcoming SIRS trainings. So there's two really big trainings and they're differentiated by who the audience is. The first one we'll talk about is the introduction to SIRS for test coordinators and administrators. This training is designed for staff who have an LEA or site coordinator role in the test operations management system and are responsible for managing access to SIRS for other LEA staff members. This session will include opportunities for attendees to practice using various features of SIRS. We also go over and talk through rostering. I know rostering is one of those, uh, sometimes it could be a challenge, uh, but once you, you know, it's like riding a bike, you do it after a while, you kind of get used to it and you can, you can do it in your sleep. But we go over um, the rostering process as well. We answer questions. So um, that first one is a really great training. The other training that's coming up as well is the introduction for to SIRS for teachers. Very similar training to everything that um, is being trained for administrators. Um, the trainings were really um, deliberately developed that way. That way the messaging is very consistent and very um, similar for both, both users within the system. So it's designed for LEA staff who have or will have access to SIRS assessments results. And we'll take a step back again. So I know last year we had year one of the introduction to SIRS for teachers. Um, sometimes we're thinking about, ooh, this is a third through um, high school or third through um, 11th grade, something like that. But with LPAC scores being available in there, LPAC is a kindergarten through 12th grade test. So just once again, taking the step back, maybe rethinking who else might need to attend to go over and access these test results in there. Um, but uh, teachers who are going to have students roster into the system uh, be a great audience to go over and we might wanna steer towards these other LEA staff who are interested in using SIRS. Uh, the session will include opportunities for attendees to practice using various features of SIRS. Once again, sandbox is utilized, going over, getting in, getting dirty. Um, you can see the specific training dates and register at cast.org. Uh, we've talked about the test operations management system or, or TOMS. And so what TOMS really does is TOMS allows LEA coordinators to do the following, manage CASP test administration, download data. That's really happening right now. Student score files are inside of TOMS right now. There's a ton of information in those right now. Written extended response by student with condition codes. I know, I'm starting to feel like I'm a, a, what is it, I'm like an infomercial here. All for three easy payments of, well, no. But you have such great data in there, those written extended responses. You'll have student demographic information. We can start pivoting things within the system. Um, you'll see scale scores. Uh, you'll see just um, lexiles, quantiles by students. So all of that lives in those data files inside of TOMS. You'll also see um, data from past administrations, also be able to access LEA and site reports. You know, the following, really, you'll be able to get the student demographic snapshot report 
what was reflected in CalPADS? What's gonna be, um, what was on that snapshot report? Student score report, SSR PDFs. If you need to print out, uh, let's say individual ones for students, and you can go in, you can search, get individual ones, print them if you need them, or you can print out um, whole batches. Um, you can also get student test settings report. Really important, really, when we're thinking about accessibilities and getting students really what they need. All of those live inside of TOMS. There's a user guide that provides detailed information about new and updated features, along with instructions for how to use each feature. It's online that has been um, linked into the Padlet. So if you haven't had a chance to get into that Tom's, um, Tom's guide, great, great, great resource. Once again, that is LinkedIn. Let's talk really briefly about the 2022 California School Dashboard. So uh, the California School Dashboard is an online tool that shows how LEAs and schools are performing on the state and local indicators, including in in, excuse me, included in California's accountability system. The dashboard is a key part of major shifts in California's kindergarten through grade 12 schools, changes that have raised the bar for student learning, transformed testing, and place the focus on equity for all students. And that goes back to what Evan was talking about earlier. In the old days, we had the bubble kids. Um, it was really about standard met, standard exceeded. Um, now it's really about every single student counts, every single student matters. And I'm talking to academic indicator, you know, in terms of students going over and, and, and growing. Um, but the dashboard provides information that schools can use really to improve. The dashboard provides parents and guardians and educators with meaningful information on school and LEA progress so that they can participate in decisions to improve student learning. The dashboard goes beyond test, test scores alone and provides a more complete picture of how schools and LEAs are meeting the needs of all students. What do we mean by that? Well, it's not just about the scores that are flowing in from Smarter Balance Summative or the California Alternate Assessments when we're talking about the academic indicator. It also looks at suspensions. There's a chronic absenteeism indicator. There's a grad indicator. And there's a college and career ready indicator. There are multiple indicators. There's also one, um, the LP for English learners. So it gives a more comprehensive look and view into progress, not just one area, but multiple areas to give us a, a more holistic picture. The dashboard is made up of reports that show how LEA and school performance on six indicators and five local indicators. And if you're a county office like uh, where Evan works or I work, we, we actually have seven. We have uh, two additional ones. And users can search to see these reports for any LEA or school. A link to the dashboard and the dashboard technical guide have been placed in the Padlet and in the resource guide. Another great resource are the Lexile and Quantile Measures reports. Lexile Measures suggest what a student is ready to read independently without the help of a teacher or other adult. Quantile measures indicate student readiness for instruction in mathematics. The Lexile and Quantile measure reports is a separate report from the Smarter Balanced English Language Arts and Mathematics Summative Student Score Reports or SSRs. The scores are generated from each student's overall Smarter Balanced for English Language Arts and Mathematics scale scores and linked to the Lexile Quantile frameworks. The Lexile and Quantile measures are produced only after the Smarter Balanced assessment has been scored. Student responses to Smarter Balanced items result in an overall ELA and mathematics scale score that only assesses California con um, California's content standards. Once the ELA and mathematics overall scale scores are calculated from the student's performance on the Smarter Balanced assessment, they're used to generate the Lexile and Quantile measures for a student. Lexile and Quantile scores are now available in SIRS and will be added to the individual student reports at a later date. So once again, you can log into SIRS and when you're clicked on, let's use the example of Smarter Balance Summative for English Language Arts. If you're on Smarter Balance DLA, there's a dropdown. You can view written extended responses, scale scores, or you can get the uh, Lexile measures, which it will plot it out for you right there on that one page student name and Lexile measures to go over and use to choose, let's say just write books or books that maybe we wanna push ourselves to go over and move up to the next Lexile range. The Lexile and Quantile Hub also provides tools for differentiating and supporting instruction 
at the different Lexile and Quantile ranges. So here's the key for that particular site though. You'll wanna access the Lexile and Quantile hub through TOMS. So we log in with our single sign-on, we get in, we're inside of TOMS. Then you'll see links at the top. When you click on links and then select the Lexile Quantile hub, your, your single sign-on will automatically get you in to go over and get those additional resources within the system. Uh, the distribution of Lexile and Quantile measure reports is is optional. So if you choose not to distribute these reports and you distribute the SSRs electronically, um, please make sure you work with your student information system vendor um, to suppress them if you don't want um, those, those getting out. So once again, talking about the Lexile Quantile Hub, um, just once again, it's providing those useful instructional tools for educators to differentiate instruction based on student Lexile and Quantile measures. Once again, remember, um, you don't want to get it really independently. You want to go through TOMS. That's kind of the trick to get it. Log in with your single sign-on TOMS, click on links, and then um, get in through there. Um, if you don't have access to TOMS, you can also go over and register with an LEA-affiliated email address um, if you don't have a TOMS login. Um, the, hub, the hub is also an important tool for parents and guardians and students. It helps them go over and make sense of their Lexile and Quantile measure reports. So once again, a link to the Lexile Quantile Hub is in the Padlet. There are also trainings that, that um, you have access to. So there was a virtual training series that consisted of two webinars um, providing general overviews. One was for the Lexile framework and the other for the Quantile framework. And there are six hands-on um, hands deep dive workshops with live demonstrations of tools available within the Lexile and Quantile Hub. Recordings of these webinars can be accessed by visiting the CASP.org website and then go to past training opportunities and materials webpage. And then you can filter down to the program is CASP and then the training series is Lexile and Quantile. You know, you know, I don't want to brag or anything, but we actually had a team from the Metametrics, the folks who created the Lexile and Quantile. Um, they came to our last uh, data assessment and accountability network meeting. And it was phenomenal. I mean, I think the one thing that's not we didn't mention here is that as California educators, we actually have access to a free and enhanced uh, access to the Lexile Quantile Hub. You just log in, and your your LEA will be recognized with your if you use your LEA uh, uh, email. And one of the things that they had that was so cool, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, now I really wish my kids had taken <laughs> the 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 cast because. They have a career uh, measure where they're taking individual, you know, uh, exploring careers and looking at what the Lexile and Quantile uh, expectations are for various careers. That's linked to um, data from from the Labor Department in terms of job growth, expected job growth, the types of um, uh, salary ranges you might expect in that field. It's really cool. So yeah, we had a we had a great time with them here, and I definitely uh, need to spend some more time myself. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, so, you know, and, and of course, you mentioned, Joe, that this uh, is linked on the uh, student score report. And so it's already populated. So the individual Smarter Balance score report for ELA and math um, are now becoming available in uh, electronically when they become available after a student completes an assessment, um, submitting both parts of the assessment, right? So both the computer adaptive portion and the performance task are required to get a uh, result for the two. The CDE initially performs a quality review and then, <clears throat> then re approves the release of those scores. And unofficial scores um, are available and can be pulled from SIRS um, and are referred to as the individual score reports. Um, the, official, the official student score reports are provided through TomStar. Please note that those are the official ones. Um, you'll notice that um, the school and state averages have been removed this year um, from the student score reports. And that's because the, traditionally, those um, <clears throat> those averages have been derived from three-year averages, and because of the pandemic, um, which caused the interruptions, we, there are not three-year rolling averages available. <clears throat> so the mat that metric's not very useful at this point. I suspect they'll come back when we have three years worth of data. And then one final reminder, because um, we use the adjusted blueprints on this most recent um, summative assessment administration, um, both the ELA and math this year, the, the claim area performance for individual students is not available on the student score report. Um, it is available, we'll talk about it in a minute in the um, test results for California, but not on the individual student score reports. So <clears throat> the CAST also has its own student score report for 22-23, 
And this shows the student performance in each science area and also contains uh, links or resources for parents and guardians. Um, there are three options for, for providing these score reports to parents and guardians. The first, you can download the PDF files from TOMS and then make them available to parents electronically by a secure method. You may be using a parent portal of some sort, and that allows you to distribute those electronically, which is very convenient. <clears throat> you can also download the TOMS uh, PDF files and print them out and make them available to parents um, using another locally determined method. You could maybe are, you're mailing them out or maybe you're uh, connecting them with report cards um, as long as you're adhering to the, the requirements for distribution of the score reports, the timeline for that. Um, if they are printed um, by the LEA, it's definitely recommended, as you can see from the colorful nature of these, you print them in color um, to give them uh, all the uh, effectiveness that they were designed for. And then finally, you can order paper student score reports from ETS, the test vendor. Um, you just need to contact your local success agent. If you're, uh, if you're not a LEA CAS coordinator, you might want to talk to your LEA CAS coordinator about whether or not that's how they're being distributed. We talked a little bit about you know how how the data is using, and this is this is an interesting, and I'm really excited about this for the future, the future use of this data. It's this uh, growth model, and a growth model is a way of measuring the growth of students' assessment scores from year to year using the statewide results. And this is uh, something we're going to have in the not too distant future. Now, growth is very different from achievement. You know, achievement such as a single assessment score just shows how much the students know at the time of the assessment. Growth, however, shows how much students' scores grew from one grade level to the next. And so in an, accountab in an accountability system like our own, aggregate student growth can provide a picture of average growth for students within a school, LEA, or student group, right? We can take all of the student, all of the scores from around the state and we can determine some expect, expectations for what a year's worth of growth would look like. And then we can apply it to individual students and then aggregate that up to the school level um, the LEA level or looking at student groups. Now, because you do require consecutive years um, to do this, to calculate the growth scores, they can only be calculated for the grades in which there would have been a prior year. So the score reports for growth would only be available for grades four through eight and grades three through uh, three and 11 don't have growth scores because of course there are no prior test uh, scores for the, those years. Um, and importantly, growth scores will not be reported on the student level. This is important. They won't ever appear on the student score report. Um, these are only going to be reported for student groups, for um, schools, and for LEAs. Um, because of the lack of testing in 2019-20, um, the data used for the growth model was interrupted, um, and we don't have actionable growth scores. Um, growth scores, however, will be calculated and released again in 2023-24. You may have heard about the growth scores before because they actually did release back in uh, 2021. The CDE released um, some aggregate growth score files. They're very interesting. And they also included a, a very informative toolkit to understand the growth scores um, and explain what these growth scores represented. And these original scores were calculated using historical data. So time it was from 2017, 2018, 19, those CAS uh, score years. So of course, when the data came out, you were really there, it was three-year-old data. You couldn't make any uh, major decisions with that um, information. But yeah, moving forward in 2023, 24, when the growth data comes out, this will be very interesting to look at. I think it, it does show, and I think this is going to be interesting. You know, it's it's very easy to get hung up on the oh the percentage of students meeting and exceeding, but what you don't always see is how you know you have these these um, some LEAs that are actually taking their student uh, student groups or entire schools and they're having greater growth than 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 average than the statewide average, and so that's what's going to come from this. And so you might be able to do some more apples to apples comparison, like comparing growth is like uh, you know high performing school districts may not necessarily have the same level of growth as as lower performing school districts, because you know it's it's a very different measurement. So uh, there are there's more information about the growth model. Um, it's linked in the Padlet, and there's and also in the resource guide. So something I'm definitely looking forward to. Another great resource to share with you is the uh, test results for California's assessment website. You may have previously known it as the public reporting website. Um, this provides information about all of the California assessments, um, and it makes aggregate data from these assessments available to the public. This is a great landing page uh, to direct your public toward. Uh, now, for smarter, balanced ELA math, the claim level data is available, like I mentioned, not available for individual students, but for groups of 30 or more, it is visible. So you can see your claim level data 
on this uh, on this site. And the site also includes um, brief explanations about each assessment with more extensive information about the CASP assessments under the About tab. Now, one very helpful feature on the website that I've actually used pretty regularly is the ability to aggregate data from LEAs across California for comparison purposes. I, you know, we were always wondering, oh, how does our how does the structure of our math acceleration um, work? And we had some comparable uh, districts demographically that we were curious, like, you know. How do they run their model? How do we do ours? And then to be able to look and compare our results, their results was very helpful. Um, the link for this page is included in the resource guide, also in the Padlet. Um, some additional features of this, uh, there's some additional, I'm like you, Joe, it's the infomercial now for the test results for Cal. But I honestly, you know, some of this stuff is like, if you haven't been back and visited this site in a while, because, and it often does happen, like, oh, we pull our information into our our, uh, our own data viz tool, and we aren't really looking at elsewhere. Um, I recommend going and taking a look. There are some cool things um, that are worth pointing out. So one is a school district, uh, school district and state comparison. So you can use the search feature to compare um, results um, of your individual school to those of the LEA overall, as well as to the state. Um, then you've got this change over time feature, and this lets users uh, view how a specific grade level cohort um, including student individual um, student groups, significant student groups, progress over a period of time. So this year you'll be able, once it's populated, you can look back. Your, your fifth graders, you'll have two years worth of data. You can see how they did over time. Um, there's also a performance trend reports uh, trend report, which allows users to view the performance of two different student groups within a single grade level over time. So you can take that feature of the change over time. And now you compare it to student groups, which is great for comparing. It's a great equity tool. Like, are we are we closing the achievement gap, right? Are we able to move our student groups? We're pouring these resources. Are we being effective? You know, we want growth for all students, but we need a, more growth for students um, who are uh, below the district or the LEA average. And then finally, um, the you can download, if you're a real data wonk, and I know some of those people are here, uh, um, the research files that are available, and these can be used for com complex analyses and customized reporting. Um, we, we download these, we pull them into Power BI, you know, for data visualization purposes. So these are also available there as well. And finally, some additional um, resources for you to explore after this training. There's the 22-23 pre-test virtual training series webinar which includes updates, um, roles, responsibilities, and, and information on how to administer the assessment uh, results. And certainly if you're an LEA CAS coordinator, it's always worth preview before you get into next year. Um, the scale score percentile tables, these are gonna contain the cut scores for each uh, percentile grouping for grades three through eight and 11 for both ELA and math. Um, the scale score percentile tables are only available for 2018-19 and before, um, as these tables do require data from two consecutive years. So look forward to that uh, being updated in the future. Then there's the data summary and cross tabulations resource, which allows users to download, download statewide CAF summary data for all students, specific student groups, and cross tabulations of student groups. See, cross tabulations, this is definitely the data wonk uh, part of the uh, presentation. <laughs> And finally, the designated supports and accommodations assignment data files. This is actually really useful. And we do a lot of work, um, our assessment unit, in sharing what kind of supports and accommodations are available. And, and it's a good way to track um, a growth or changes in time over the use of specific supports and accommodations. So you can see the download this file, look at the number of accessibility supports that were assigned to students. Um, it's not indicative of the number uh, used by the students. These resources are available for all of you to access on your own, and they're also linked in the Padlet. So we have a few minutes, so this is the exploration time. So um, let's take, uh, I don't know, five minutes? I, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at Chelsea. Chelsea, is five minutes good here? Because we have a few more slides to wrap up. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, okay. five, we'll bring people back in about five minutes. Okay. So let's explore some of the resources that we've highlighted in this section. They're all linked in the Padlet. Um, and then let's answer this question. What new ideas uh, do you have for using some of the resources discussed to support teaching and learning? And I'm hoping to see references to the downloadable data files that I know that my people are here. <laughs> but if you know, you, most of you have your camera off, um, we'll reconvene at 3.12, we'll reconvene at uh, 3.17. So take five minutes, look at some of these in the Padlet and, and come up with some ideas. What would you, 
What new ideas do you have for using some of the resources discussed? Joe, as we get ready to come back, did you did you go explore a new tool, or do you have an idea what you might do? You know what? So it's funny when you were mentioning the uh, accommodations and designated supports. So that was the one that I just wanted to go over and pop over to really quick, just as a, you know, just a little refresher, um, because we same same as you, uh, we utilize that tool a lot, and so just wanted to go over and check to see, you know, the new one. The new one is in there, but. Sometimes when you open it up and you look and you say, you know, what's being assigned and how many are being assigned? And it was funny, I was just thinking in my head right now about abacus and how many times do we, you know, do we talk to our kids when an abacus is assigned? Do you know what an abacus is? Do you use it? Yeah, well, we got a few assigned. Maybe we need to talk, you know, talk through, you know, the practice of using them. So, but that one particular tool, uh, tons of great tools in there, but that one in particular, we just have to, we utilize a lot. Yeah, I just went, I pulled up the performance trend report in the in the test results page. Um, and I, you know, yeah, this is a good one. I've got a presentation coming up with working with one of our local districts. Um, they actually did administer uh, the full assessment in 2021. So, yeah, so they have pretty consistent, you know, once it was available. So I was able to look at, you know, some of the student group over time, and I didn't realize it actually goes back by grade level um, as far back as 2018 results. So that's actually really helpful. Um, e even if they hadn't administered, there's data there that's helpful to look at. So you can see these changes over time um, in a way that I think um, is very accessible for folks. So that's really good stuff. So yeah, put in the chat since we're back now, um, we've hit our five minutes. So if you have uh, an idea, what would you do to use uh, some of these resources to support teaching and learning, or I'm going to expand on that to, to maybe uh, share with your educational partners, um, what might you use of the features that we've talked about or these resources? I'm hoping somebody puts in the Lexile quantile information. Like I said, I think that's going to win over more teachers when they have it, because it really is designed for parents and for teachers to use. And that data can be really powerful. Um, and especially, you know, if I'm if I'm talking to parents at a back to school conference and I've got this data and I can talk to about, you know, suggested books, suggest, I mean, what a great resource for teachers. And and if I'm gonna piggyback on what you're saying there, Evan, it's it was one of those we had conversations with uh, with a few of our districts uh, a few months back, knowing that there were going to be Lexile measures available at the end of this year, really. And then thinking about that next incoming year, then the conversation started, Are we? do we need to assess students at the beginning of the year when we wanna start thinking about reading groups if we have this incoming data already? Is there one test we may be able to get rid of? So, um, you know, I, I agree, Lexiles is really where um, there's a lot of, there's a lot, there are a lot of resources involved with it that could really go over and support teaching. So we do see tracking how effective our learning loss programs were by using the test results for California page, tracking change over time for two groups. Great. Yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, practical use of this data and certainly be able to articulate it to, to parents and uh, show them you know, uh, the website to help out. Well, thank you for your taking the time and sticking. I see some, most of you are still on here, which is great to see. Uh, we'll turn it back over to Chelsea to close us out with just some wrap up information. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, and thank big, big thank you to Evan and Joe uh, for leading us through this presentation and providing, um, you know, your your expertise and your real world experience and application. Uh, it, it really makes the um, the presentation uh, so much better. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, you see here that there is a QR code that is uh, shown on your screen right now. If you have a few minutes, we're going to spend the next maybe two to three minutes. Uh, you can utilize your smartphone to take a picture, uh, use your camera on the QR code and it should bring you to our exit ticket or exit survey for today. We really rely on people's uh, responses 
two surveys. The survey will also be emailed to you at the conclusion of our time here today. That should be out um, by tomorrow uh, for you if you don't have time to fill it out right now. But if you do have a few minutes, please, please take this survey. Uh, we really look at your feedback and utilize it to make sure that we include information in these offerings that is of use and value to you. So I'm going to pause for just uh, two minutes and let people uh, have some time to uh, complete this survey. So as you're wrapping up this survey, I'd like to take just a moment to revisit our learning goals for this particular session uh, that participants will have at this point reflected on how summative assessment data supports system improvement in a local assessment system, identify important considerations for using summative results that are specific to this year's test administration and context, and also to understand where to access and how to leverage those uh, summative assessment resources. And then our success criteria for today are that participants can leverage resources to use summative data to inform decision making, so placing everything in a particular context. Thank you again for staying with us today. Uh, as I mentioned, you will receive an email uh, tomorrow by the by the end of the day tomorrow with a uh, thank you and also a link to that survey if you were unable to complete it at this time. And we hope to see people back uh, for the rest of this training series over the next few weeks. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.